So we've come almost to the end now of, of two full days of really insightful and interesting and educational and thought provoking discussion. Lots of great people from government, from industry, people who've been in both government and industry providing lots of great thoughts about where are we going? What are the challenges? What's all the great stuff that's happening? What Tom, what GSA have asked us to do now is to, is to bring that story home now, to synthesize all that and to think about, okay, we have EO 14057, and what does that mean for the government going forward uh, for a data center operations standpoint? So we've got a couple of panels now of folks who will have a lot of great insight into that. And this first one here now is, is a bunch of people who everybody will recognize as, as former esteemed leaders within government, within the technology business of government uh, to help us down that path. And so I thought I would start just really quickly highlighting a few of the things that I've heard over the last few days as key points that have come out. And then we'll go around and have everybody a chance to, to weigh in a little bit on, on a couple of those thoughts. So I think number one, you know, there's a lot of discussion throughout about the need and the importance of aligning mission and figuring out how to align that to what are your data center plans, be it in the cloud, be it on an on-premise data center, be it in a colo data center. And then embedded within that less explicitly, but I think equally important is the idea that people really have to figure out how to prioritize and rationalize their applications and, and their workload. So that, that was an underlying theme throughout. Second underlying theme throughout is really what the last panel was speaking about in almost every forum in every session workforce came up in one way or another. It's, uh, do we have people who have the right skills to understand the challenges that are facing us from a technology standpoint, from an acquisition standpoint, across the board? So there's a recognition of the need for that. I think that there was a, a really good set of case studies that highlighted the importance of driving innovation and government and industry working together. Uh, the, the CIO from USPTO said, I think, adapt or die. And so, you know, that might be a little bit of an extreme message, but 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 I think underlying that is the, is the reality that the technology is moving, the opportunities are out there. How can the government figure out how to best take advantage of that? And then the last thing that I'll note that was really important, we had a session on it just a few minutes ago, is, is the importance of figuring out what are the right things to measure? How do we incentivize the right behavior? By identifying those things, there's a lot going on. Sustainability goes far beyond just PUE as, as Julius and Green Grid were just talking about, how do we actually think effectively about that going forward and understand that we've got to get beyond the, the, the mindset that we've had in the past on DCOI, which is just how many data centers do you have today and how many data centers are you going to have next year or the year after? Not that that wasn't an important exercise. It forced CIOs to understand what they had, but moving forward, that's not going to drive the right behavior. So what I'm going to do now is go around, as I noted, and, and ask everybody for a quick sort of opening comments. I'm not going to read any bios uh, right now because I think everybody knows who, who we've got here on the panel. But first, I'm going to go to, to Suzette Kent. Suzette, of course, is our former federal CIO and an esteemed technology leader for many years. So Suzette, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And, and over to you for a couple of opening remarks. Thanks, Gordon. And uh, I have to also uh, give a shout out to Andy there. I've, I haven't seen uh, Jamie Wolf end on time in a lot of discussion. So uh, I'm, I'm impressed at the event you're running. Now, I, I'm, I'm glad to be here, Gordon. You, you gave a great start. Um, and there's been lots of great discussion over the past couple of days. But I think what what we want to talk about is, you know, there will always be technological change. There will always be new goals. And these sustainability goals are important, but they are part of the journey. Um, and we have to stay focused on, you know, mission first and build kind of the new goals into whatever that journey looks like, but not kind of jump to a new measure and a new thing without understanding what that means and not bypass the real work that we have to do at the foundation. You just touched on it, Gordon optimizing the workloads, changing our business processes, doing the work first around, you know, what the mission set is, and then making the right decisions about cloud, about what our data centers look like, and then reevaluating those and having the conversations like this to force changing the metrics. I know we'll get into uh, some of the discussions in the panels uh, as I look there at uh, Joe, I know he and I spent a lot of time saying, 
As you just said, we've counted data centers, that's done. We need to move on uh, to things that are gonna elevate the tie between technology and mission and ensuring that by the actions we take and the metri metrics and measures we sign up for, we're still supporting mission. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great, thanks, Suzette. And I know I can't wait to talk more about some of those issues with you, uh, much like we've done for, for years. Uh, and since you already teed up Joe next, jo Joe, why don't we go over to, to, to Joe, former CIO at the Department of Justice, now I think leads the, the CIO advisory practice at KPMG. So Joe, welcome hey. and over to you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, thanks for inviting me today and great, great to be here. Uh, as you, you know, Gordon, you worked with me there at Justice, but uh, we closed 100 of 110 data centers in six years. And so, yes, we spent a lot of time counting data centers. And we really did consolidate a lot of, uh, you know, workloads and move them into three core uh, on-prem data centers. And we also modernized a lot of legacy systems through uh, cloud-based platforms. And I look back, I, I think of uh, Vec Hunter's 25-point uh, plan in, in 2010, and, you know, he had a goal of... Uh, closing 800 data centers by 2015. And, you know, I really think we, we probably exceeded, uh, you know, closing 800 data centers, yet the, probably the total number of federal data centers on the books probably went up. I think counting data centers, it's an easy metric and it's a, it's a good first step, uh, easy to grasp, but not very useful. Uh, to me, it's all about the efficient uh, uh, service delivery. And as a CIO, you, you have to look at that as your first priority. If you're not delivering good, good services, you're probably not going to last long. And then you need to really have a plan, you know, a detailed plan of action and metrics to assess uh, performance. When I think about the uh, data centers, uh, they're really part of your IT portfolio and a, a tool in delivering these outstanding services. And you need an architecture that uh, defines how you're going to effectively bring together data applications and compute. They all need to all be in one location, but those are the three big things that I, I think about. And then I think um, we need to think about uh, and determine what's, what's the most important. Uh, you know, as a CIO, you can't optimize everything. So uh, I think Suzette talked about this, but performance, cost, resiliency, cybersecurity, they're you probably can't optimize against all of those at one time. So pick something that you're most focused on. I was most focused on cost avoidance, cost savings, um, and getting uh, workloads to a more resilient area. And I think about the, uh, what is the role of a federal data center? Uh, do we need on-prem data centers at all when you look at the commercial uh, cloud options that are available? So I'll stop there, but looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Joe. And, and definitely some points there that we will undoubtedly get into more of the balancing priorities, obviously something that we spent years struggling with. And, and, and we had a panel yesterday talking about cybersecurity and its relation here. That's an example of, of where I think we, whatever guidance we can give to GSA and to CIOs will be, will be very helpful here. Um, I'm going to go over now to, to Frontus. Frontus, I'm not sure between you and Joe who spent more years in government, but I know both of you uh, have impressively long careers. And of course, Frontus Wiggins, former CIO at the Department of State. And to prove the point, I think coming to us from Vienna still, because uh, apparently once you get the travel into your blood, you can't give it up, right? Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah. It's uh, By the way, that's Vienna, Austria, not Vienna, Virginia. I don't want to sound pedantic, but people <laughs> often get confused. So. Yeah, I, I think Joe's got me by a couple of decades, but that's just because he was born before I was. But uh, he's, he's looking great for a 100-year-old man. Um, all kidding aside, it's great to be here. And I just want to riff off of a couple of things that both Suzette and Joe said, uh, and some of the things some of the earlier speakers mentioned. I think DCOI was great in its day. And if Dave Pounder is on the, on the line here, he's probably going to like send a kill switch down to me as I say this. But, you know, its day has passed or it needs to modernize and mature. And I think the idea of optimizing a data center is kind of passe. We need to look more at things like data harmonization and data hosting. And when we start talking about that, I think we also have to realize that there are a lot of things, and I may be preaching the converted here, uh, of things that need to take place before you do that. And I'll give you an example. You know, you can move stuff off-prem, you can close a data center, but if your cybersecurity is not in place, 
and I use this analogy on our prep call. So I'm, I'm, you know, Gordon, you can go ahead and mute me if you don't like this. It's like if you step in dog poop, right? If your cybersecurity is not in, in the right place, you're going to track that dog poop to your data center or your house or wherever your case may be. And I think that too often there's this rush to move to the cloud, rush to move off-prem. But what are you doing? You're just shifting your problem into somebody else's environment. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our partners is a company called SpyCloud. And just two days ago, I looked at Department of State right now. There are currently 347 compromised state accounts right now where people are logging on as state users. Some is logging on as, well, I'll just use myself as, as example, Wiggins FB at state.gov. And they're going into Azure and they're going into AWS and they're going wherever with my credentials because they've hacked them. And I think that if you're going to really focus on the data, because the data center, the center is not important, it's the data that's important. You've got to protect that data. You've got to make it available. You've got to make it credible, right? All those things. And in order to do that, there are many things that have to take place first. And then we start talking about hosting the data and where it should best belong. And I'll use as example, as you said, I'm here in Vienna. We have at least three equipment rooms that Dave Pounder would call a data center. But I can't, for the life of me, think about closing down the data center at the embassy in Vienna when you're relying on a couple of local ISPs. And the example I always used was Beirut, or excuse me, Baghdad. When we first went to Baghdad, we had to diversify our route out of the embassy. Well, guess what? There was only, only one ISP. So they took a connection out of the east side and the west side of the embassy, and then they met on the north side and the main distribution for the ISP and then went out. So DCOI and what constitutes a data center and how we approach data hosting is important. And I think that DCOI was often, because it was a little immature, was a cudgel rather than a scalpel. And I think we have to take into account the mission, as other people have said in this panel, and exactly where that data should be hosted to allow for the availability and the confidentiality and all the important things that go into that. And I know you told me to keep to two or three minutes, but I usually don't say hello in less than 15. So now I'm gonna pause and turn it back to you, Gordon, and I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of interesting discussions here today. Yeah, front is definitely the points that you're making. And I think in, in a lot, what a lot of you and, and Joe and Suzette are saying, we're gonna get into that, what are the first steps? And it's really defining a lot of these pieces that, that we're all talking about. Uh, two other things before I go over to Pete. One is thanks for clarifying Vienna, Austria. Uh, and secondly, I'm glad you just said dog poop and not uh, what you might have said in the, in the uh, prep session. But with that, uh, I'll go over to the last member of our panel, Pete Saronis, who, if you've been paying attention to the summit for the last two days, if no other reason, then you know Pete from his active engagement in all of these sustainability issues. So Pete, welcome to the panel. Thank you for joining as well. And, and over to you for some opening remarks. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's kind of wild being a panelist. So I, I am fired up because I can actually not have to worry about the question and be the hook guy, uh, which hasn't been the case. Uh, hey, I'm going to echo uh, when you when you hear folks like Joe and Suzette and and of course, Frontis, you know, deep respect for, for these individuals. And yes, our former lives. I was told once, you know, what's it like or many times being a former shiny penny and I'm like, I'm, I'm a lot smarter and I can do a heck of a lot more. And it's nice seeing things outside of the bubble of the beltway, which I've been blessed to do. But terms, mission, rationalization, workload management, 100% when you're talking sustainability. And for two days, we've heard from national laboratories, from CIOs, from, from nonprofits, from service providers. Uh, I'm a fan of regulation that needs to happen and metrics that need to be developed. But I'm also a guy who focuses now on the cities and the communities and the municipalities of the future. Humanity, we heard Sylvia and Ann and um, uh, Vaughn echo that. Why are we doing it? So hopefully today uh, we'll talk a little about why this matters, not get you know maybe hung up on, on the fact that you know compliance, yes, is important, reducing carbon footprint, but how do you do it and what's the benefit? What's the impact? Um, as long as in my parting opening shot, if you will, is if, if we're delivering significant and scalable economic and societal benefits through what we've heard throughout today, smart something, smart traffic, smart uh, sustainable infrastructure, precision alcohol, uh, alcohol, that would be interesting, agriculture. Um, Actually, that's smart alcohol. That would be really interesting. But public safety, smart cities, folks, 
it takes this whole of government and industry approach, right? The data center and sustainable AI machine learning platforms, that's great. It's not the problem. Do we know our workloads? Do we know how much uh, uh, bandwidth latency transport we need? And that's something that's hard. Nobody likes doing that. Do you know what you have and do you know where you want to be? The cloud's our solution. The edge is now in play. The threat landscape, to Francis's point, also goes along with that. So we want the creature comforts. We want the data at the fingertips. We don't want the single sort of, you know, uh, log jam of, of a former, just the one data center that we have with guns, guards, and gates. But with that, we balance risk of, of breach and also the opportunity to innovate. So I'll be coming at it from what I've seen in six and a half years since I've been out where it's in parts of the country, people need basic internet access. And, and we'll just hope that a, the data center somewhere is helping them realize that. There's too many unserved and underserved regions in this country, if not the world. And, and I hope we can dive into some of those use cases. Thanks, Pete. I would suggest you rush out and try to trademark smart alcohol. You might be onto something with, with that in particular. But since you said it in public, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to, to uh, get a trademark on it. Somebody else might have. Might have That's all good. It. Hey, hey, there are a lot of home brewers out there that have probably done that. Uh, they very well might have. So, so uh, you know, just in the message that everybody delivered there, I, I want to go back to the to this underlying point of mission and rationalization and the undeniable reality that faces CIOs and other technology leaders in agencies right now, which is that there's just a lot of requirements. And you know, Jamie Wolf just said something earlier about his people are all busy all the time and they want the easy button for how to do sustainability and. Certainly, that's understandable. But at the same, you know, he and every CIO is faced with with the cyber executive order and zero trust, and that's got a whole host of requirements and these sustainability requirements. And you can just go on and on down the list. And so the question is, you know, there isn't an easy button here. As much as we'd like to be able to tell Jamie that there is one, the question is, how do we help government? How do we help GSA and others? move beyond what a former boss of mine used to call the tyranny of the urgent, the you've got your pressing problem of the day, and we all remember that, to thinking about sustainability, which isn't the pressing problem of the day for any CIO, but undoubtedly is a critical long-term issue that they've got to deal with. And so how do we help them start with that and balance all these different challenges? And so, Joe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it over to you, and then I'll open it up for everybody else to jump in on that one. You know, the, um, I think comes down to a couple of things. One is uh, we've got to provide the right incentives. And, um, you know, I think uh, a little bit of carrot and stick. I mean, incentives for sharing. The, the government data centers don't generally uh, scale and there's not a lot of incentive for, for sharing like you would find in the corporate uh, world. Um, you know, the, the um, I think getting the right priorities and uh, if, the, if the government can get the right priorities, the right metrics, the right things, it's you know, if you focus in on, I think industry, private sector will support. Uh, I also wonder, you know, at the same time, can NIST be more prescriptive in terms of these federal data centers? Uh, NIST is a great organization, um, got, they've got guidance and architecture uh, galore, but, you know, can they help in terms of what does a sustainable government data center look like? Uh, and I think, you know, the, the transparency is absolutely key. We must continue with that. And I can talk about some of you know what I would view as success, but I don't want to take everybody's time. But I, you know, I think that we we need to think about what do we want as a government in terms of these data centers, and then the pieces will fall in place. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Suzette, if you can follow up on that, because I know we've had that discussion about what do we actually want out of out of government data centers, and are we able to effectively figure that out and and manage that? And and you had a, I'm sure unique perspective from your former role in seeing that. Yeah, well, and and Gordon, I'll say something too about, again, recognizing the, the journey. Um, choosing a place to start that's attainable. So when you when you look at that whole executive order, there's a lot of things in there. It's, it's, it's for a long game, 2050, right? And there are some things that, that are sooner, but, you know, what we measure creates behaviors that um, sometimes have unintended consequences. And, you know, 
if we if we try to do all of that at one time, we're going to get components of it wrong. So start with something that's attainable. That's the approach we use with the federal data strategy. It's the approach that has been used over multiple administrations for zero trust. Maybe it's the buy clean portion. Maybe it's some measurement of um, emissions. But what what we also need to understand is metrics that are reasonable in a federal environment so that we move the ecosystem at the right, at, 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 um, in sequence, procurement and funding. And the, the concept of starting to gather common measurable data and look at it before we put it on a scorecard or we circulate it with the CIOs, with the mission, um, with the CFOs, with the CDOs, and, and look at, does this matter? Are we moving you know, in the right direction? And then set the metrics. And I know when we were preparing for this, you know, I, I actually said, I was a fan of finding some metrics and measures, but not making them formal immediately. Um, looking at those as leading indicators and having a robust dialogue about if it were this, right? Are, are we truly seeing progress? Does this, is this matter, you know, across the agencies? Can we capture the data? And um, are we not signaling some unintended consequences? But ensuring that those things are achievable. And the last thing is that we follow it with funding. I know some of our um, operationally sustainable, you know, lab uh, uh, um, data centers and operate that are at the top operate and, and in private sector operate at a different price point than we currently fund across many agencies. So if we're going to achieve all these goals together, we need to understand what that run rate looks like and make sure that we're committed to it and, you know, that we're not going to ask agencies, you know, I don't want to say the unfunded mandate work, but ask them to achieve things that are not attainable with the resources that they have, whether financial or the investment in people, because this is a different kind of operation. Yeah, it almost sounds like you're saying that that a, a necessary step is, and, and of course, we're all familiar with this, the, you know, you've got to define a plan and what's a cost, but then the administration has to be held accountable on their side to this isn't just like you said the the unfunded mandate uh, four letter word right which there's there's we we all know there's there's no shortage of um, and and we've got to figure out how to get past that if we're serious about about some of this front us over uh, any thoughts on this oh i've always got thoughts um just whether you want to hear them or not it's a whole other kit and caboodle um yeah i want to uh, echo something that suzette just said what we measure as consequences and i think in, under the old DCOI, it was data centers. And as I was saying earlier, every embassy had a data center. So the Department of State had 270, 280 data centers, some of which were basically an office with two split pack air conditioners. And yet we were driven by the metrics as laid out to say, you're gonna close X percentage of these. Uh, and the option was, well, great, where's the tick, overseas tick? is how can we close an embassy data center or an embassy uh, uh, communication center and have to reroute everything back to the States from Australia? You know, so I think we, number one, you have to think about what you're measuring and that's really important. And then the second piece of that, of course, is in order to be successful, you have to get buy-in from the C-suite, right? Seventh floor, we used to call it in the Department of State. You have to do something that's gonna have meaning to the secretary and their senior folks. And I think that uh, one of the biggest areas you can look at there is the so what factor. You know, are you going to be rewarded for closing those data centers or optimizing or maximizing or whatever you want to talk, call it, other than just getting, no offense, a scorecard and getting a pat on the head from Jerry Connolly. Um, so I, you know, I've got some ideas about, and I'm going to throw these out later about using the, uh, the, ITMF, the Technology Modernization Fund, as kind of like a bug bounty kind of way to get at it so that people are incentivized in the right ways to be more innovative and try to go out there and push these things out there. And I also think that the whole data hosting issue, I'm going to keep saying data hosting until people tell me to shut up, um, is a means to an end. It's only part of the journey. And I think that if we learn nothing else from this god-awful 
virus that we've experienced is that there is a chance and an opportunity here for, to go after things in a different way to realize real cost savings, change how we recruit, change how we work for the federal government writ large. And we've got a window of opportunity to take advantage of while people are paying attention. And that ties into this whole data hosting, changing the platform and figuring out exactly ways to modernize because I think the data centers are the small piece of the sustainability issue. And I'll get to that in later comments. And look at that, I kept that under five minutes. That, thanks, Frentis. And I think a whole host of things that we could certainly follow up on from, from the incentives and, and response standpoint as well. But I, I think one thing that I want to get Pete's views on, because coming from Department of Energy, you know, it highlights different agencies, different missions, state, lots of stuff scattered in embassies all over the world, DOE, big data, big super compute capacity at national labs. And so, uh, you know, Pete, how do you think about you hear on the one hand state in front of us is saying we've got to figure out how to measure effectively there doe when you were there and still today very different set of challenges from a from a mission standpoint yeah and i you know i i will say that you know as jamie pointed out the department of energy is a very unique agency i mean it it's it hasn't been around forever and it was born once as the atomic energy commission and then it grew into this agency of ridiculously talented smart people uh, that are scientific and engineering. And yes, we there are a ton of supercomputers in the national labs, which are an extension. And then you have the NNSA, which really is its own administration, right? Um, supercomputing, we learned, you know, yesterday, if you if folks were there and those who visited the labs, I've been to many, many labs of our labs. And I mean, they do great things. They're super fast. And, and the need, their biggest challenge, supercomputers, is power, consumption. Who needs information? So the better we can get at asking questions, whether that's through artificial intelligence, machine learning, leveraging DSIM tools for the DSIM market out there, the data center infrastructure management tools, examining how can we naturally cool a data center? These are questions that we can ask really, really fast computers that don't go to sleep at night as much as we love our own brains and want to noodle over. The days of from the movie numbers where we're at whiteboards, we can ask questions. And supercomputers can provide those perspectives and insights. So for me, I think, yes, we can leverage these purpose-built platforms. And I know Suzette has visited many of those, as has Joe, and they used them at NOAA and Francis, I know you the power. We need to, I think, be incentivized to understand that we're probably only tapping the capabilities of you know, current supercompute, next, next generation exascale, and then someday quantum, if we ask the right questions. Because I want to quote one thing for anybody watching. Go read the Digit Act from 2020. Okay, it speaks to the Internet of Things and the impact. And the, one of the quote was, by, they expect by 2030 that we will have 125 trillion devices connected. Now, that number's probably gone up since 2020. But that kind of connectivity, that kind of ubiquitous connectivity should get people like, wow, that's amazing. As I read a Drones article this weekend in the Wall Street Journal about delivering packages, and I'm thinking, who's managing all the security and the connectivity? And that to me is, I think, part of that incentive for all of us. And it was mentioned, I think, by Joe. Forgive me if it wasn't Joe. The sea level, this isn't a tech thing. This is a, this is a citizen thing. This is a CEO thing. And it's somebody who's working in our SOC and data center to say, with all that connectivity and all that promise, what's incentivizing us? Not to meet a scorecard, but to make sure we're doing it in a societal and an economic uh, it, with an economic intent for the betterment of humanity. Yeah, I think, Pete, the incentive point there is really important and this capacity that exists at places like the National Labs and how good a job are we doing at sharing that even within agencies to say nothing of across agencies and making sure that those capabilities are made available. And I know, Joe, we, we struggled with this even just in DOJ when the FBI was building data centers to share those services with with the other components of DOJ. And that says nothing about the challenge of if we were going to another department. And, and so it really does raise, Pete, this question of incentives being at the core of figuring that out. What's the incentive for any given CIO or any given acquisition officer to make the right decision for the government as a whole to do the sort of things that you're talking about? And, and I know I found that to be a very challenging thing because every day I'm being told we've got to deliver for our mission and you've got to make the choice for the mission first and, and all this other stuff. Yeah, that's nice, but that's that's really secondary. So I know, Suzette, we've spent some time talking about this. I don't know if you want to jump in. 
Yeah, um, I, I, I was I was listening, you know, to, to Pete there, and um, I, I'm going to go back and put, you know, pull on a, a couple of things, and actually some of the things from your from your last group. Um, how do we how do we achieve great outcomes faster? And, and very often that's to look at where we're doing it well, and and share those learnings. Um, but those, there, there's a lot of variables. And I think about when I visited a data center in Colorado and what they could do for cooling and powering is way different than Arizona or in the middle of, you know, Idaho. Or when I went and visited my, you know, friends that are below sea level in, in other areas. Um, the playbook, making a, rep, a, a, a playbook that can be replicated in our nation with the various sources is, is a little is, is a little harder in this case. Um, and, and again, as you talk about tying it back to mission and how that rolls through the entire process, um, it, it, you you heard that you know that 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 playbook helps us with the how, the humanity, and the mission goals are the why. And again, as we're moving along this journey, um, the checking the boxes is front of set on a scorecard is not necessarily what you know we want to do, but it, it's a it's a lever that um, is often used by those outside government as an indicator of progress. And again, I'll go back to you know the leveraging playbooks out of you know those who have done it well and having actual dialogues about what does not just a a score look like but what are the measures of progress as we move to you know 2050 in all the disciplines and by the way don't just measure the cio that 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 means the cio has to drag everyone else with them in these processes and then take the beating when it doesn't happen. <laughs> look at look at the partners, procurement, the CFO, data that we're going to organize differently and the mission demands, right? I know many times uh, we'd have a conversation about, well, wait, we can do this better. And the mission team was like, no, I want this, this thing this way. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and make sure that you've got all the individuals at the table, because each panelist has said it in a different way. This is not a technology play. This is technology honoring the goals of sustainability and embedding it into the work that they do. Yeah, I think Suzette, that's spot on. And we heard that in one way or another from a lot of speakers over the last few days who have said, and from the industry standpoint, of course, the technology is here, just come and get it and use it. And from government folks, it's uh, how do I find the right ways to, to do that smartly and effectively, like like you just said, and the, including other stakeholders um, and, and, and having that be respected and not just being dumped on the, on the CIO. I know, you know, that that obviously is a is a critical challenge and something that we all struggled with. And, and Joe, I'm sure you've got thoughts on how do we pull in other stakeholders in, in an agency that have uh, more accountable executives and more leadership that's that's vested in in these goals. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't do anything without uh, being in lockstep with your uh, CFO and your chief acquisition uh, officer, and you know you, you need to have all your your entire digital C suite needs to be aligned. Uh, but uh, everything's in the government's done with acquisitions and with money, so uh, those two individuals are are really important. Uh, Gordon, you know just. I agree with everything I've been saying. Uh, these are all very important issues and things that have to be dealt with. But uh, for Tom Santucci's, uh, you know, just to make sure that, you know, since we're talking about data centers, I'll put something in there. It's been a long time uh, front, it's maybe 50 years since I, I designed data centers, but uh, I did that once upon a time and I always followed Big C standards. You know, these are international standards for, uh, for, for IT and telecommunications. And, there's two in particular. There's 002, which is data center design, includes energy efficiency, and Big C is 009, uh, which includes data center operations. And both of these, um, you know, have data center performance and uh, efficiency and sustainability, productivity, operations embedded in there. And, and 
I think if you know, yes, Francis, I agree that data compute um, those things are extremely important in terms of how we manage those. But if we are still talking about data centers, I think it's important that we design government data centers to meet the same kind of standards that you expect it to be built in industry and to the highest quality stand, you know, standards. So as a follow on question to that, though, Joe, 100 percent government should be following standards. But, you know, well, better than I do, the time lag from the time the government starts to design and build a data center to when it's when it's delivered. And we can look at the FBI facility in Pocatello as a great example of that. It's a five year journey. And in the intervening time, the leading data center manufacturers, builders, operators, they've developed two new generations of technology. Well, I think the, the acquisition process in general has to be addressed in the, in the federal government because, you know, it's a, it's time you, get, you can't even do the acquisition until you get your budget. And that's a two year, a three year uh, cycle in and of itself. But my point is that uh, uh, we want data centers to be as efficient as possible uh, if they're going to operate uh, in these capacities. You know, I think the other thing that um, front of got me thinking about the uh, all of his, the State Department and forward deployed data centers. It's just going to get worse if we try to you know count data centers because of edge computing, and we really need to look at that as a, another tool, another way of deploying data uh, to the front, you know, the forward uh, edges of our you know our mission. And um, uh, I think we've got to get away from that. But what we do pro provision in in IT has to be as efficient as possible. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a how do we do that in smart, effective ways across government, though, right? And, and manage that efficiently. And Tom has repeatedly told me about his experiences of a data center with a bunch of racks that are being barely utilized, if at all, and a bunch of end of year money spent to buy a bunch of storage that's just sitting there in a box until the warranty expires. And I know we've all, in one way or another, experienced those sort of challenges. I do think I want I want to come back to to the. The, the point you were making sort of in contrast to Frontus and, and the, the edge computing and the, the, the data centric view that, that Frontus was advocating for, because Frontus, I, I think it's, a, it's important to bring that back into the conversation and talk about, as Joe was saying, we need some government capacity here. You know, how do you manage and balance and make decisions about when to do those things effectively for the government versus when it should be that we can leverage an industry best practice? And we heard a great case study from from the Air Force yesterday, working with Equinix, Joe doing exactly that, right? Taking advantage of some of Equinix's global capability and edge capability in ways that the Air Force would still be struggling to, to start today if they were doing that themselves. And so, so Frontis, you know, you definitely live that on the State Department side. So, so you know, how, how should we be thinking about that and finding that right balance? Right, and thanks, uh, Gordon. Now, I would say it's that old adage of best of breed, right? If Government can do it better, cheaper, faster, then that's what government has the edge. But if there's a private sector that can meet the same standards from a security perspective and an availability perspective, then, then you can go the other way. Because I think that the incentive really has to be, or let me, let me back up a second. I think what has to take place is data has to be look at, looked at from soup to nuts. You have to make sure that as you were pointing out, Gordon, or as Tom mentioned earlier, who's still accessing that data? How often is it accessed? And is it open to the public? Is it open to just the folks within the, the agency? If it's not being accessed very often, perhaps it could be put in a different platform that is cheaper to run. It could be harvested out to a private company. But if it's something that has to be available every second of every day, then that's something that has to be a little closer to where the end user is. And where what we did with that in the Department of State is, we looked at the most critical data that was used on a daily basis, and then we regionalized it. So we collapsed it out of the edge of the embassy and put it into a regional location. So it was still there. And then there's a backup back in the States, and there was a second backup back in the US, in a second location in the US. And I think that there are criteria that you can use to say, okay, what's the level of security required here? What's the level of availability that's required here? How often is it really being accessed and should we be mothballing some of this data and retarding off to NARA instead of just moving it to a different platform or buying another you know, chiller for that, that, uh, that data center? And I think the other thing is that the incentive piece of this, uh, I, I'd like to, I hope we get to this uh, before the end, obviously, is what would drive this to say, okay, 
if I'm going to be given credit for doing something by closing a data center, moving the data to a, a public environment or you know, off-prem, what is, what is my real gain and how am I going to sell that to the C-suite? Because if I'm just saying I'm closing down some servers or racks or whatever, the average CFO probably doesn't care. But if you can show that you're doing some things that are enabling the workforce, empowering the workforce and doing other things, that's what's really going to get people's attention. So um, I, I guess we're going to get to incentives in a little bit. Unless yeah. you want to launch on now. No, no, I think for front desk, we've only uh, got about 15 minutes left. And so I, I think I want to pivot the conversation a little bit to what are the next steps and what are the right incentives to drive the sort of behaviors that, that we're talking about? Because I think collectively across all of us, there's sort of a similar sense of what, what needs to happen. But I definitely want to start talking specifically about that. So so please go ahead. Well, and Gord, can, I want to... Yeah. I want to pull on what what Fran has said there around incentives for uh, really quickly. He was going in a, in a place around credit, around recognition, mm -hmm. around investment in workforce, and how does the government get private sector industry to do that? Exactly that, right? That is exactly what is happening in some of the sustainability spaces in other places. And, um, you know, as somebody who's gone back and forth between government and private sector, it is very interesting to me at times in places when industry is held accountable to a standard that we don't meet inside government in the same way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those incentives um, aren't, aren't as used laterally across. And Again, when I look at the sustainability EO and, and the overall goals, and I saw one of the, uh, there was a question from one of the panelists. There are things that agencies have to decide and drive for themselves, but there are some things that the government as an influencer and as a, a, at the center, so real estate and facilities that we own across the board, um, influence in the way that we're buying and expectations of our partners that we can use to influence, you know, achievement, but also holding ourselves to those same standards. And front of SAS, a really important question is why, you know, yes, we all want to do it for humanity, but on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. what do you do that makes someone change how they've always done things? And that, that's how we start. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Suzette. That is the figuring out what are the first steps and what are those incentives. And so, so um, Frontis, why don't we start with you and then go around with everybody and think of you know what what are those key first steps? So Frontis and then Pete and Joe and then back to Suzette. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, I had a two tier approach uh, that I thought might be worth considering. You got the IT modernization fund, and right now the way it's structured is an agency, com agency comes up with an idea. They go and get funding, and then they have to show savings at the end. And what I would suggest is you reverse that algebraic formula and instead say, okay, here's a, I'm going to close a data center or I'm going to do something different. And I want to get something out of it at the end. So if I can show that I'm optimizing a data center and change my data hosting, I should be given probably a scalable amount of money, depending on how much money you save out of the ITMF to spend on whatever I want. And I don't have to show cost savings from the project if I can show cost savings up front by the data optimization or the data center changes that I'm going to make. And what CIO or CFO or C-suite person wouldn't like to get a pot of money? Of course, you're still accountable to Congress for it. But to say, if I go ahead and change how my data centers are structured, I'm going to save this much money and I'm going to get, you know, you could set like a bar of like, uh, you know, 500,000 savings, a million savings, 1.5, 2 million and then at the end of it, the CIO gets a certain amount of seed money to do some innovation project. I think that would drive incentive. The second thing I will say, and this is where I'm gonna get a little crazy, so hold on a second. As Suzette just mentioned, real estate. If we are going to consider how to host data and where the data should be, as the pandemic has taught us, we can do business practically from anywhere. I'm not proposing closing every federal office building, <laughs> but for crying out loud, you know, the Department of State has 32 annexes spread across the DC metro area. If we could allow our folks to do more reaching out to the data where the data is hosted in different locations, 
and close some of those facilities where we're paying a couple, three, four million dollars a year in, in rent and leases, the sustainability, the environmental impact of closing those offices and closing those facilities would probably outstrip some of the things we're talking about with data centers and changing, you know, whether you got a one IU or whatever the, the devices. And I've even come up with some really clever acronyms for you. So you heard it here first. So we got the smart liquor going on with Pete and now you're gonna hear four acronyms from me or three. The first one's tongue in cheek, Federal Office Optimization Initiative. That's FUI. I don't, I don't like that, but I thought federal real estate effort, which is free. And then the one I like the best is federal real estate evaluation reform, which is freer. <laughs> so I think that, you know, I think those two incentives, number one, giving the CIOs credit for doing some data center optimization or data hosting optimization to give them money to spend on innovations. And then number two, then taking a look at the real estate that's out there to actually close federal offices and allow people to work more remotely. Because look, Joe Biden, President Biden just talked to Xi Jinping remotely. If that can happen from the White House, why do we have so many things going on in person? I'm not saying that that should go away entirely, but I think we have to think more critically about that. And now I'm gonna be quiet. No, I think Frontus, a lot of that is spot on. It does speak to the need, much as with all IT transformation of agencies being willing to rethink their practices and the way they go about their business. And they can't just keep doing it this way because that's the way we've always done it. And I know we've all we've all encountered those challenges. I, I do, by the way, of those all, maybe like FUI the most only because it speaks to the, you know, years ago programming experience and right, the, that, that used to be the name of, a, of dummy variables and things like that. Uh, Pete, over to you, same same question, you know, and thinking about incentives and, and first steps that are, yeah. that are right for us. Well, number one, Suzette mentioned journey, playbook. If you don't have a plan, the plan will fail. I mean, and, and that's awesome, Suzette, so shout out. Uh, front uh, sorry, Pete, just to, just to interrupt, is that plan at a department level, a, an agency level? Where does that reside? A whole of government level? Who's thanks responsible? For, thanks for the hardball as I'm in a flow, man. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, I love you, Gordon. So so I was getting there. So what's the incentive at the end of the day? Well, it starts with having a plan, right? And and we'll, I'll explain what I mean by uh, shout outs to Suzette. Uh, Suzette did it all the time. Her predecessors, they put out guidance. We had something from Congress, be it an act or a bill that incentivized the Office of Management and Budget to push out guidance in the form of a memorandum. We got 14028 and Colonial Pipeline was hacked. We all got in touch with what does OT and IT mean a year ago. We've seen gas prices. We're seeing now what happens when the energy sector is impacted by a war. Okay. The M22090 Trust, here's your incentive. If you're a selling into the government, give the, reason, give the government a reason as money is starting to flow as a result of that to reimagine how they can prioritize funding to solve what 14057, 14028, as I quote, to modernize the federal government, quote unquote, cybersecurity, there's other stuff. Advance towards zero trust architecture, accelerate movement to secure cloud services as a service, centralize and streamline access to cybersecurity data and invest in both tech and personnel to match those goals. What's your plan agencies? Work with industry, get best practices. There is money. Largest purchaser of IT is still the federal government. Industry is rolling and rocking and not, not any particular order. You heard it from Kate Brand alone today. There's an opportunity to do some great things that others and other countries are doing. So the greater good is the incentive. The, 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 the federal agencies, you've been given guidance. Industries like, where's the money? You wanna know where the money is? The money's there, it's your tax dollars. Give the government a reason to spend it and come to them with a plan and see if it aligns with their mission. But don't quote Fatara, don't quote a metric and say you're great at it. Great, Pete, thanks. Uh, Joe, same, same question over to you. Yeah, I think uh, Gordon, there's really only three things that are gonna work as incentives. And I, I like Frontis's, uh, may not like his acronyms, but I like his idea that, uh, you know, financial. Um, that is one of the three things that uh, will get people to move, right, and, and take action. And some way to reward good behavior, uh, so the financial side. The other is you know, public recognition. I think uh, uh, somebody, maybe Frontis or Suzanne, you met, mentioned this, but, you know, some kind of award for, like, who's, who's uh, doing the right thing. So we've got to describe the right thing, put it into the plans, and then um, 
you know, OMB can recognize people with uh, different awards at the end of the year uh, for either uh, efficiencies or or sharing data centers, you know, or uh, moving to uh, commercial facilities. I think the last one is transparency uh, because we need to continue doing that, but we need to make sure we're focused on the right things. And I'm just going to go back to the, you know, the, the title of this uh, uh, summit and, and one of the reasons why we're here in sustainability. And that's, you know, maybe, you know, all of government agencies, the IT shops, all CIOs had to have this goal of being carbon neutral by a certain time. And then, you know, what's the plan for getting there? Uh, force them to, to measure something like that, like much like counting data centers. But you also have to look at, you know, green energy uh, versus, uh, you know, data center in West Virginia. And I had a bunch of those, uh, you know, and, um, you know, is that if it's burning fossil fuels versus uh, solar or, or um, you know, wind or anything like that. And I, lastly, I'll just say, you can't ignore water, water consumption. A lot of these uh, data center operations are very intensive in that. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, it's something I'm very conscious of. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, Judd, definitely the, the water measurements have come up in a number of the sessions today as, as metrics that need to exist and as part of the overall package of sustainability for sure. Suzette, I want to go over to you, not just to address the incentives and, and the first steps, but we've only got a few minutes left. So so what is what does success ultimately look like here for you? If you're you're back in your former job, what what does 2030, 2040 look like? You know, Gordon, uh, this is not an original answer. It's success is judged on the outcomes that are produced. And, you know, in, in, in 2030, 2040, and 2050, um, we're, we're approaching any resource that we use with the idea of sustainability, right? But we're still addressing mission. And, and the, the dialogues and questions we're having today is, is just adding to the discipline about with about how we do things. And I'll, I'll make a really simple environmental you know, comparison. Think about litter, something as, as silly as that. And, and years ago, um, we, we, got, we got to a place where it was out of hand and we elevated and paid attention to it. And now in most cases, in most places in our United States, that's looked at as a crime, right? We, we changed our behaviors. Elevating it is about changing behaviors. And we heard that when it's part of success is when it's part of how we do work. When the, these are questions that are embedded just like really good design principles when it's part of our everyday job and it's a conscious component of the decisions we're making when we, we put together any type you know, of operation, which again, we're focusing on data centers, but we use a whole lot of resources doing other things in the federal government as well. So it's part of what success looks like is it's part of our, our everyday business that our outcomes, we are continuing to improve and finesse the impact that we have, you know, on our world. And it is part of how our people go at every activity and part of the, the training. Um, that's what, you know, success looks like to me. And that's in line with the missions that we're already yep. serving. But yep. um, I want to plug one last, last two little things. The Technology Modernization Fund could be a source. Um, as far as was put, it, it specifically says emerging technology, administration priorities, and there are pathways for even having some of the payback relieved. So an agency that has an idea of how they might want to, to go about this, they, they have that opportunity to, to have a conversation. And what I think has really been great about many of the technology modernization fund projects is that they produced a deliverable that was reused across multiple federal agencies. So maybe, you know, I know that GSA one time did one project where it was that they, they, they learned something on behalf of every other agency. Maybe there's opportunities for that. And the last thing I'm going to say is I'm going to, um, for those listening, I'm going to ask you to think about ways that we got, we, we play in times where we really moved quickly. 
um, we did a couple of things united around the mission and focused, but we also stopped doing things that weren't value added. And I think that's a tough question that agencies should ask themselves. Um, you heard Jamie say it, you know, maybe just to the end. Um, at the end, I have so many things to do every day. How do I make capacity for one more? You stop doing the thing that's not adding value. And if, you know, this, if we agree on the focus and direction, maybe some, we need to apply some discipline on what we stop doing and um, create that's a, hard, that's a hard thing to do, but I think, I think you're hundred percent right. But I know I certainly never had anybody in the FBI or in the broader DOJ, Joe, I suspect say, it's okay. We don't actually need to keep doing that anymore. You can, you can stop doing it. Right. So it requires senior engagement in the, in the agency to make that decision. Yeah. Gordon, it was a big fight during the pandemic, but guess what we did yeah. because we had to, and that created the capacity, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Joe specifically because he remembers some of the pain there, but it was a time when results were delivered and everyone moved fast. Yep. When there is that burning platform, the government yeah. is amazingly able to do it. Absolutely. It's uh, how do we create that around sustainability? I think is, is part of the question. Frontis, you have your hand up and I'm going to give you and everybody else besides Suzette 30 seconds for finishing remarks. Not that I don't want you also, Suzette, but I just want to make sure everybody else has a chance to, what does success look like for them? Okay, 30 seconds or less. Smaller U.S. government footprint, change in businesses, business processes to allow more remote work, and take the money that's saved and plug it back into the U.S. infrastructure for the average citizenry, because we got the haves and the have-nots out there. We're talking about government and providing services and other things, and there are large parts of the country where people don't have access to high-speed internet to this day, and I think that's a crime. So if we can realize savings here, it needs to be put back to the people who need our services, because at the end of the day, USG is here to serve the citizenry. So I think through all those different ways, we can actually have an impact on the average American citizen. There, less than 30 seconds. Bye. That was that was beautiful, Frontis. I, that, was, that was perfect. Uh, Pete, uh, parting thoughts from you, what does success look like? Well, I think it's uh, to everybody. My parting shot is, you know, stay educated, stay informed. You will be enlightened. There's a $1.2 trillion ton of money that's that's coming in to support the sectors that we use and are part of every day. You know, don't read all 2,000 plus pages, but look where the money's going. It will eventually be released to industry. That's the mission. Arguably, that's the incentive. Data centers are a part of it. Zero trust is a part of it. The Internet of Things is a part of it protecting assets. There's no silver bullet. So for me, it's, if everybody understands when we use the word mission, that there are about 450 plus agencies in the government, according to the federal register. So Joe's and Suzette's and Francis and mine and others. And today you can't sell into the same way to the same mission, stay educated, read, 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 absorb, and then go have conversations with your federal colleagues. Good stuff usually happens. Thanks, Pete. Uh, I think words of wisdom for all of us. Um, Joe, we're, we're a couple minutes long already, so bring us home. Uh, I think we need a whole, holistic view of data centers, the cloud, uh, how CIOs are going to deliver service. And as Suzette said, every decision needs to have uh, sustainability uh, in, in the forefront as far as you know, how we make those uh, decisions. Those de decisions should be data-driven. Thanks again, Gordon. Joe. Front is Pete, Suzette, thanks so much for making time today. I think great discussion. Hopefully Tom's taking away some usable information here because I know he's on the hook to deliver a roadmap for the future of, of government data centers and federal data centers. And so- um, Knowledge and alcohol. <laughs> smart smart alcohol. He might he might have rushed out to, to trademark that already on, on top of Pete. So I would, I would keep an eye out for that. I just wanted to say thank you for for joining this, but I also wanted to say to Suzette and Joe that started the Cloud and Infrastructure Community of Practice. We've grown to over 4,000 members, and with zero trust, we're going to probably explode even more. So it's, and we've also created a training platform, and we've trained over 2,000 federal employees um, in cloud um, products. Perfect, Tom. Congratulations. Yep. Thank you for starting that. All right, so uh, uh, 
That group, Joe. Oh, Joe, here's the uh, shovel you gave me for the FBI data center. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. All right. Uh, Again, uh, you guys are, of course, welcome to stay. I'm still on the hook now for the next panel with our industry leaders. So if uh, Terry and Chris and Nancy can turn your cameras on and uh, we're going to go through uh, hopefully a similar conversation, but now from an industry perspective about uh, what are the challenges, lessons, opportunities to really help the government move forward from a, from a data center sustainability standpoint. Um, as I said to the, to the former group, and, and just to recap briefly, uh, you know, thank you all for making the time today to, to join us. Thank you guys for um, being part of the conversation. Really what we've been charged with is we've had a couple of days of of great conversation, a lot of input on the importance of sustainability, 